Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce this evening. Uh, my name is Paul Finch. I'm Programme Director of the World Architecture Festival. Uh, my connection to St Bride's was as chair of the fundraising committee, uh, which raised the money to restore Wren Spire, um, which in daylight you'll see in fairly splendid uh, glory uh, these days. Uh, that appeal was launched in 2011 and it seemed to us, and in particular Gerald Bowie, who did most of the work on the Inspire appeal, uh, that we should mark the appeal in some way and what better way than to uh, institute uh, the Wren Talk, uh, which has now taken place. This will be the eighth year uh, that it's happened. Um, the first speaker was... Wren's biographer, Adrian Tinniswood, a wonderful biography uh, called His Imagination So Fertile about Wren the Great uh, Polymath. Uh, and we've had a series of quite different speakers um, in subsequent years. Um, our architect speakers have included uh, Terry Farrell, uh, Ken Shuttleworth, and last year uh, Eric Parry. Uh, we've had Simon Thurley, the former head of English Heritage, talking about heritage. Uh, Peter Rees, the former city planner, talking about the making of London plans, uh, then as now. And we've also talked about people who are contemporaries of Wren or had some other connection. Um, Dr. Anne Matthews uh, gave a wonderful talk on uh, the work uh, of Sir James Thornhill, uh, in respect of the painted, his artworks and the painted chapel uh, at Wren's uh, Royal Naval College. Um, and this year we have uh, another change of pace, if you like, um, about which I'll say something in just a moment. Two uh, masked and socially distanced. Uh, and particularly to those of you who are watching from home uh, or your home office, um, welcome to this event uh, and we hope you uh, enjoy it. Um, secondly, in addition to thanking Gerald Bowie for uh, all his work in organising this event, uh, we'd like to thank the Wren Insurance Association. Um, Wren, because it consists of architects who self-insure, uh, for their support in allowing us to uh, film and broadcast uh, this occasion. Uh, the subject of this year's talk, uh, Nicholas Barbon, uh, I'll say nothing about because I'm going to leave that to the speaker, other than to say uh, that he's a most significant figure in the history of, of London, uh, in many respects, and should be much better known uh, than he currently is. Uh, our speaker, Jeremy Melvin, is a colleague of mine at World Architecture Festival, uh, but he's also a writer and historian, a visiting professor uh, at UCL, and I think has become uh, rather fascinated, uh, not just by Barb on the man, but about the ferment of ideas within which Barb on uh, wrote and thought in, in that most extraordinary period uh, the, latter, the latter half of the 17th century, uh, which not that long ago would have seemed a very strange place. Uh, civil unrest, fire, and plague. Today it doesn't seem quite so different. Please welcome Jeremy Melvin. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, can I repeat my welcome to everyone, those who are physically here and, uh, and those who are bothering to make their electronic devices work. And I'd also like to say how delighted and honoured I am um, to be giving this talk, um, not least because this is, I think, probably the single most splendid uh, work of architecture in which I've given a lecture. I mean, normally university lecture halls don't quite reach these heights of design quality. Um, and uh, also because I think um, Wren, as I hope will become clear, is I, almost certainly the most significant uh, 
of all British architects. Now, that's a very big claim, but I will try and substantiate it. Um, but the other side to this, of course, is, as Paul mentioned, Nicholas Barbon. Now, who was Nicholas Barbon? I mean, I hope that will become clear during the course of this talk. Um, he, he was a, a fascinating character. He was a near, pretty close, the exact contemporary of Wren's, although unlike Wren, he didn't live to be over 90. He died when he was around 60. Um, and he had an enormous influence on uh, the shape of London as it emerged from the fire uh, of 1666 and as it developed through the, certainly the 18th century, arguably the 19th century as well. And um, I will uh, try to unfold at least some of that. I mean, he did an awful lot of work um, and we won't have time to go uh, to cover it all in, in, in any detail. Um, but what I want to suggest is that these two figures, whose diverse careers and their diverse interests and skills, uh, actually helps us, the relationship between them helps us to understand uh, London in its 17th century and subsequent complexity. Now, uh, this is, of course, a, a view of London famously by Wenceslas Holler of 1648, so not that long uh, before the fire, 20 years or so before the fire, um, but also showing that I think, and I think uh, we can say that in about 1600, London was in a pretty grim state. Um, the policies of Queen Elizabeth I, who was queen from 1558 until 1603, had sort of been anti-London. Uh, she persuaded or, or sought to persuade the aristocracy, uh, almost all of whom were uh, quote, new men, uh, to live on their estates, uh, which they may have felt slightly insecure of their ownership of because many of them were former monastic lands, um, but partly to, out of self-interest and partly to cement her position because they would be able to um, uh, police um, the, the, the territory of the country. And the consequence was that London um, on which there was pressure for development, uh, had no planned development and was uh, approaching squalor. It had an enormous and uh, originally very impressive medieval cathedral, um, but by the 17th century that was um, more or less uh, or nearly a ruin and certainly a cause of great concern. And Wren, among others, uh, tried to work out how it could be rectified. Um, now, but this was common to many great European cities of the time. Um, you know, Rome, um, despite many full starts, uh, was still basically a, 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 a decayed shadow of its ancient glory. And those full starts started as early as 1417 with Pope Martin V. The, 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 the um, and they didn't really um, come to full fruition until the 1660s, under uh, Pope uh, Alexander VII, of course, working probably in this case primarily with Bernini, but, but the contributions of Borromini shouldn't be entirely forgotten. Um, so Rome is, is, is perhaps in a comparable state to London. Um, Paris, uh, despite the comment of Henri IV, uh, originally a Protestant, um, that, uh, who, who was required to convert uh, to, to become king of France, um, his comment was that Paris is worth a mass for, um, and of course the uh, districts like the Marais had been developing in the late 16th century, uh, under, with architects like Philippe de Lorme and the emergence of the Hôtel Particulier. Um, but it was still essentially a late medieval city, uh, although its transformation had started uh, with, what, uh, with uh, what was originally called the Place Royale of uh, 1605 to 1612, uh, that's under Henri IV, um, and uh, now called the Place des Vosges. And then, of course, it, it really in Paris comes to fruition uh, with uh, Henri's grandson, Louis XIV, and uh, his chief ministers, people like Colbert. And, of course, Paris is the one uh, foreign trip that we know Wren made in the early 1660s. Um, but other European cities include Amsterdam, which in 1600 was at the bottom of a pretty steep curve of transformation from a fishing village to a great commercial center. Um, and its commercial success was underwritten by the long-term plan that was just beginning to emerge at the time. 
Uh, Berlin was not much more than a village in the great northern Europe, European plain. And of course, St. Petersburg doesn't come into existence until you know, the early 18th century. So um, London is not unique, is my point, in, in being a bit of a mess around about 1600. Now, before I continue, I just want to uh, 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 acknowledge the work of, of a number of different people which I draw on, and I will be slightly, I'm afraid, fast and loose in not acknowledging every idea and giving it a source. But the, the, but the, the key people I want to acknowledge are Leo Hollis, uh, Elizabeth McKellar, uh, William Letwin, who uh, wrote a book called The Origins of Scientific Economics. The relevance of that will become clear in a moment. And of course, the incomparable survey of London, much of which is available online, which under the circumstances of the last few months has been invaluable. Um, and then, of course, Wren's biographers, Adrian Tinniswood, or recent biographers, and uh, Lisa Jardine. Um, now, what was the extent of London? Uh, the top slide is London in 1600, the bottom slide in London in 1700. Um, now, it has some particular circumstances which are not shared by these other European cities I mentioned just now. Um, of course, there's been a huge political uh, upheaval uh, in uh, the British Isles uh, in the middle of the 17th century, the Civil War. Um, and the, the uh, settlement that is achieved after the Civil War with the restoration of the monarchy, the restoration of Charles II, the executed King Charles I's uh, son, um, is that the country cannot be absolutist. And that is confirmed in the period we're going to talk about uh, by the uh, so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, uh, the Act of Settlement of the following year, where the um, uh, supremacy of parliament the, uh, is, is established over uh, the, that of the monarch. Um, and that, of course, had, had been achieved de facto anyway by the parliamentary victory um, during the Civil War. Um, so what we have here is a city which has no precedence. There are, you, know, you can't say it has the authority and the grandeur and the political structure of Rome or of Paris um, or, or perhaps even Vienna or, or Madrid. Um, because it's, it, it has to be done by negotiation. Everything in London is achieved by negotiation, and that negotiation is underpinned uh, by uh, the rule of law, as we shall see, and indeed the laws that are passed in order to facilitate um, that, uh, that process of redevelopment after, after the fire. Now it also, and I think this is from a historian's point of view perhaps the most interesting thing is, why were there so many talented people available at this period in the second half of the 17th century, the last third of the 17th century, to work on this reconstruction? Not just the two people we're, we're talking about, but, but why was there a remarkable generation? Now, you know, earlier generations of architectural historians, and I'm not thinking of any names, Nicholas Pesner, uh, might have attributed it to the zeitgeist. Now, I don't think that historiographically holds up, but there is something about the social and the intellectual conditions of the time, no doubt um, affected by the uncertainties uh, caused by the Civil War and, and, and the upheavals around that, um, that allows people of talent and of intellectual ability um, to thrive. And I think that's true uh, of Ren and Barber and, and others. Now, one of the points that happens around this, this period, um, in fact, a little bit earlier, is to consider business as a particular discipline. Now, we don't have business schools, obviously, but we do have people beginning to think about what makes trade important, what makes commerce important, and to what extent is commerce important to a state, particularly a state which is trying to chart a new course. Now, um, the, 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 in the Middle Ages and, and, uh, and beyond, uh, business was sort of an adjunct to theology because the rate of interest that could be charged, if indeed it could be charged at all, was a theological issue. Um, and when that breaks down, 
um, you know, during the, the, the Reformation, there were all sorts of reasons why it does break down, partly because it's a completely kooky idea, um, but it had held sway for a very long time. Uh, there is a new urge to have a similar authority for setting the terms of business. And indeed, um, this is set out by um, merchants who write about how they, they, they believe this should be organized, like uh, Josiah Child, um, who is probably the richest merchant in the city of London uh, in the uh, last part of the 17th century, deeply connected with the East India Company. And he's worth about, uh, argues William Letwin, or suggests William Letwin, about £200,000, which doesn't sound that much now, but in the late 17th century, it was probably uh, any realistic figure, although the Bank of England won't, won't confirm this in an inflation, strictly inflationary sense, will be several billion. Now, um, so this is all informing what London can be, because if the terms on which you can trade and operate and commerce takes place, it obviously affects the, 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 um, the city of London in particular, the whole of London in general, as became, I think, very clear in the uh, subsequent century, in the 18th century. Um, but, but there are also other issues about London which need to be resolved. You know, one of them I've alluded to is how can the country be governed? You know, this is a huge issue um, that is debated endlessly both by the parliamentary party and by the monarchist, mon mon monarchical party because what is realised is that A, absolute monarchy is not acceptable and doesn't work terribly well and B, its replacement by the Cromwellian regime wasn't a rip-roaring success either. So, you know, in a sense, all bets are off. And this is something that, that people of intelligence are naturally um, uh, drawn to because of its urgency. Um, so, that... Uh, I think we'll move on... Uh, here we are. So the, this is a picture. The one on the left is supposed to be Barbon. It's not, I'm afraid, an authentic portrait. But the one on the right is, is, is authentic, and it's Wren. And obviously, it's showing him as an architect holding drawings um, with his uh, most famous and probably most important single building um, in the background. Now, just to say a few words about them um, for, for, for those uh, who don't know. Um, London is what forms and gives opportunity to both of uh, these two uh, figures. Um, both have uh, connections in London. Uh, Barbon was, uh, was, was born in London. Uh, Wren's grandfather was a successful uh, mercer, successful merchant. Uh, although uh, Parentalia, the memoir of the Wren family put together by, by, by Christopher's son, another Christopher, um, and this successful mercer was able to educate uh, two sons, both Wren's father, yet another Christopher, and um, the elder Christopher's uh, brother, Matthew, at Merchant Taylor's School uh, uh, in the city of London at the time, and a natural place for a mercer to send uh, sons. Um, and, uh, and then they, they went to Cambridge. Both had uh, careers in the church, you know, uh, quite successful, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, Wren himself, although not born in London, he was born in his father's rectory in Wiltshire, um, goes to school in London, not to Merchant Taylors, but to Westminster, which was the great bastion of royalism throughout the Cromwellian period when it was run by a headmaster called Richard Busby. Um, and uh, many of the people we will be discussing had some connection uh, with that school. Um, now, London is, is also somewhere where, where someone with the, the talents and predilections of um, praise God Barbon, who we will uh, see here on the left, the father of Nicholas, or, or uh, as Nicholas was uh, baptised, if Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned. Um, a reflection of the uh, fashion for uh, uh, puritanical figures to, to, to give their children very morally moralizing names. Now, we don't know what that would have been shortened to, um, but quite possibly just damned, as in damned Barbon, um, which was a sentiment that many people would have, would have recognized. 
Now, um, praise God is quite an interesting character. We don't know much about his origins, but he was articled to a leather seller. Uh, he clearly becomes quite well off. He manages to acquire a property um, just off Fetter Lane, not very far from here. He's also able to send his son to university, presumably because he has enough money to do so, but he sends him into the um, sort of Protestant heartland of the Netherlands, um, although you know, Cambridge in particular was, was uh, a strongly a puritanical university. Um, but uh, but, but uh, Nicholas studies at both Leiden University and Utrecht University. Um, now, Praise God was a firebrand pe preacher. He's a member of a separatist church. That means that someone who believes in the separation of church and state. And he also has a political career. Um, he becomes a common councillor on the city corporation in 1649. And four years later, in 1653, uh, he becomes a member of parliament. And indeed, he gives his name to the so-called Barebones Parliament. He's one of um, seven MPs uh, for the city itself. Um, now, uh, Dean uh, 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 Christopher here, the, 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 the father on, on the right, father of the architect Christopher, had many um, significant positions in the church. Uh, first of all, he was rector of, well, he had several uh, uh, positions, uh, first at Font Hill, then at East Noyle in uh, Wiltshire. Um, but then he succeeds his elder brother, Matthew, as Dean of Windsor. Now, Dean of Windsor is obviously a very important position um, at this time in the church, because the church is under the influence of Archbishop William Lord, who uh, believed absolutely and fed the um, sort of fantasies of, of uh, King Charles I about absolutism, um, and that there should be, that, that, that worship should be, in quotes, in the beauty of holiness, and that it should uh, basically uh, promote the idea that the king was the anointed of God and therefore unchallengeable. In other words, it's, it's an argument for absolutism. Now, the Wren family, both, uh, both the, the brothers, Matthew and Christopher, uh, were close to the Laudian party. Matthew, perhaps, slightly closer than Christopher. Um, Matthew was uh, chaplain to Charles I when, as Prince of Wales, he and his friend, the Duke of Buckingham, went on their harebrained scheme to try and marry the prince to the Infanta, the daughter of um, uh, the, the Spanish king. Um, and as chaplain, uh, Bishop Matthew had to accompany him, even though he, he has reservations about it. Um, and he is close to Lord. He shares many of Lord's uh, beliefs in what the church should be, what its role was, and how people should worship in church. And he rises to the hierarchy. He becomes Bishop of Ely, um, but he's um, uh, deposed by Act of Parliament. He's kept in the tower. He does survive to be reinstated after the restoration of 1660, but he does suffer for his faith, as did his younger brother, Christopher, who is also deprived of his livings. He manages to survive by living with his daughter, Susan, and, and uh, son-in-law, William Holder, um, where Wren, uh, Christopher, that is the architect, seemed to spend some of his childhood. Um, but interestingly, um, the, the uh, Dean of Windsor, uh, Christopher, had, according to Tinniswood, some quite significant intellectual interests in astronomy. So what I'm saying here is not, I'm not giving some sort of Freudian argument that we can uh, read Barbon's and Wren's careers as functions of who their fathers were, but it's quite clear that both parents set a sort of intellectual and operational platform for, uh, that their sons learned from, uh, and we shall see how that happens. Now, the other uh, significant thing that's happening uh, around this time is um, advances in science. Now, those advances in science uh, come from several different directions. One of the most important is the discovery and the publication of um, the circulation of blood by the physician William Harvey, um, which is published in 1628. And the two diagrams, bottom and right, uh, in this slide are, are both from that. Um, now, this, of course, is a huge step forward in, in, in medicine. 
Um, and uh, medicine was beginning to be seen to be able to work miracles. And it obviously fascinated uh, Rembrandt in the famous painting uh, shown here of the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tope painted in 1632, so not long after Harvey's uh, publication of the circulation of the blood. Um, now, just, just as a sort of anecdote, um, about the importance of medicine and, and the uh, great power it was seen to be beginning to acquire. Uh, in 1647, Wren, as a 15 year old, uh, is ill with what was thought to be consumption. Um, and he's taken out of school and he's treated by a physician called uh, Charles Scarborough and he is cured. And this is seen as semi miraculous, but not a miracle in the sense of. Uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead or curing the sick man of palsy. It's seen as being a miracle through the application of modern scientific learning. So again, that's something that, that, that Wren um, could have learned from. Now, we don't know what the treatment Scarborough prescribed was, but as uh, Tenniswood notes, it, it could have been something along the lines of that he gave to one of the mistresses of the uh, King Charles II about 20 years later um, when she wanted to lose weight. And he said, eat less, use more exercise, take physic, or be sick. So, you know, um, quite practical um, and, and, and not dependent on any sort of uh, uh, particular sort of magical um, or, or indeed very sophisticated scientific uh, learning, just, just good practical um, work. Now, another uh, example of uh, medical, uh, um, I don't want to imply that this is a, a, a really a miracle, but I can't think of a better term just off the top of my head, is that um, in Oxford, in the 1650s, an unfortunate young woman was condemned to death uh, for um, infanticide, and um, she was uh, cut down after being hung, and uh, she was found a few hours later still to be breathing, and she was revived by a team of physicians, some of whom Wren knew, uh, which included someone else who we will mention later, William Petty. Um, and so again, you know, the new learning could revive someone even when they should have been dead. And uh, that, that story has a slightly happier outcome in the sense that um, this uh, unfortunate young woman wasn't retried. It was seen as God's will that she had survived and therefore uh, beyond any earthly jurisdiction. So you get this strange combination of religion and science. Uh, coming together here. Now, many of the people we talk about were involved with medicine. Barbon, of course, studied physic, as it was called. We don't know, there's no record of him ever practicing, although he was a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, so he must have satisfied them as to at least his knowledge, if not his competence. Um, Wren dabbled in physic. Uh, John Locke, who we'll come across later, dabbled in physic. And as I mentioned, William Petty, about whom we'll say a bit more later, was also involved in um, medicine. Uh, up to a point. Um, now, the other side of the new science uh, was the enormous um, insight and contribution made by um, uh, Francis Bacon, who we see here on the left. Now, Francis Bacon was dead before any of our um, subjects were born. He died in 1626. Um, having been Lord Chancellor, uh, he was a son of, of uh, one of the great ministers, uh, really second only minister to um, uh, William Cecil un in Elizabeth's reign, um, and uh, then obviously becomes a very distinguished lawyer, although he uh, in incurs the wrath of Elizabeth um, and uh, probably was denied preferment in her reign, although that came subsequently under her successor, James I. Now, he was also, so not only is he a successful lawyer and uh, public servant, but he's also credited with the birth of that distinctive British or English contribution to philosophy, uh, empiricism. And he writes in, in one of his most significant English works on uh, uh, science, um, which is uh, science and, and philosophy, in many of his works are in Latin. This is the advancement of learning. Uh, he challenges the predominance of Aristotle as a thinker about science who, you know, for the last 2,000 years. Um, and this is a quote. Uh, 
for as water will not ascend higher than the level of the first springhead from whence it descended, so knowledge derived from Aristotle and exempted from the liberty of examination will not rise again higher than the knowledge of Aristotle. So what he's saying is that, you know, you're never going to go beyond Aristotle if you're going to be throttled by him. And the only way you can do this is by, uh, you know, the liberty, as he calls it, of examination. And this underpins Bacon's view of how science should advance. Um, that it should advance through the observation of natural phenomena, natural history as it might be called, um, and uh, through experiment. And then from the conclusions of observation and experiment, you can, by, again, the so-called inductive method, you can begin to deduce general principles. So he's almost inverting, you know, 2,000 years of, of Aristotelian thinking where uh, the principles come first and then the facts are fitted to them. He's saying, look at the whole range of experience and of nature and then try to derive principles from it. Now, this was the basis um, of the aims of the Royal Society, which was founded uh, in 1662, in which Wren um, was, took a leading part at the time. Um, and it was uh, to part, one of the central aims of the Royal Society was to find useful, useful knowledge and to apply new knowledge in a useful way. And for that reason, it was very interested in trade and commerce as it was in um, what we would now think of as science and medicine. Um, and uh, that, that was one of its, uh, its great goals. Now, the other person here is another important figure in the, um, the uh, emergence of the Royal Society and of the new learning. Uh, and this is, uh, on the right, uh, Will John Wilkins, who lived from 1614 to 1672. So he comes somewhere between Bacon and Wren and Barbon. Now, he's important for a number of reasons. Um, one is, I mean, although he was a Cromwellian, um, Cromwell eventually appoints him uh, as the, um, um, the, the uh, head of uh, Trinity College, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, but before that, he was the Master of Wadham College, Oxford, where Wren was a student. And at Wadham, Wilkins put together a really significant group of people um, who were all interested in science both the sort of total ramifications of the new science, but also individual practitioners. And they included Wren, they included Robert Boyle, they included people we've, we've alluded to, um, William Petty, uh, Robert Hooke, um, and, uh, and Locke was on the fringes of it, he wasn't a member of the, the uh, college. Now, um, he, uh, as I say, Wilkins, um, was the orchestrator of this group. It doesn't seem that he was a great scientist in his own right. He wrote a book in 1648, which we see under the portrait of him, the, the, the uh, frontispiece, um, called Math Mathematical Magic, with a K, as you spell physic with a K uh, this time. And that was, I think, the closest thing we could call it to now is a work of popular science. Um, he uh, talked about uh, mechanical powers in which he saw Archimedes as a great sort of originator uh, and of automata, um, which was to become a big obsession, uh, particularly in continental Europe in the subsequent hundred years, uh, and in which he saw Daedalus as the um, sort of key figure. So one of, one of his heroes in this book is uh, a real historical figure, the other one a legendary figure. But, he, but the book was quite popular and um, it went through several different editions throughout the um, 17th century, um, the second half of the 17th century. Now, the other thing that I think is important in, 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 in this is the emergence of um, and of, 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 of certain new ways in political thinking. As I said, the, the um, out and out uh, republicanism, the puritanism, the Cromwellian position and his uh, parliamentary colleagues um, was not seen to have been a success. Um, that's why there was a restoration because it, was, um, there, it wasn't clear 
Um, what would happen after Cromwell died, his son was clearly not up to um, taking on his father's uh, position. And indeed, Cromwell held everything together, you know, by force of personality. Um, and of course, the old uh, uh, absolutist notion of the role of the monarch uh, was also uh, discredited. So there have to be new ideas. At the same time that there are new territories to um, uh, divide and govern and acquire and uh, control in some way. And a key figure in this is uh, John Locke. Uh, best known now as a, as a philosopher, but he was also a physician, and unlike Barbon, we do know that he practiced physic. He saved the life of his patron, the Earl of Shaftesbury, um, and he was also uh, a political thinker, although the degree to which he was independent of Shaftesbury uh, is, is perhaps slightly questionable. Now, one of uh, uh, Locke's first forays into political thinking is the constitution for Carolina, the, what is now North and South Carolina, um, which were uh, colonies then of, of England uh, and of course now states within the United States. So they're, they're among the 13 colonies that, that um, uh, instigated the War of Independence and, and the uh, independence of the United States in the 18th century. Now, um, Locke was a principal author of um, this, the, the Constitution of Carolina. Now, it's a strange document for a number of reasons because it's um, notable and has been indeed um, cited for its promotion of religious toleration. But it is also advocating an extreme sense of hierarchy. It advocates uh, serfdom, it, it is um, sympathetic to slavery. In other words, it's not an entirely woke document, um, despite advocating a rule of law, um, the uh, inalienability of private property and secret ballots, uh, and, as I say, religious toleration. Now, 20 years later, Locke came back to politics uh, with his uh, two treaties on, on government, where he argues that uh, government is essentially based on social contract, and in this he follows closely, although uh, I haven't been able to uh, go into this in great detail, there are other people whose uh, knowledge of this is far greater than mine ever will be, um, uh, follows the great Thomas Hobbes, who uh, published Leviathan, uh, and dies in 1670, uh, I think. He was born, or was it 1680? He's born around the time of the Spanish Armada, 1588. And he's one of these people like Wren, who has a ridiculously long life, even by the standards of the day. Um, but he had been working on um, Leviathan for much of the middle of the uh, 17th century. And, and, and a lot of Locke's ideas are based on, on the notion of social contract and the idea of, of um, people uh, essentially being free, but the benefits of associating together and thereby giving up some of their liberties in order to prevent, in um, Hobbes's memorable phrase, life just being nasty, brutish, and short. Now, but what Locke is arguing here in, in, in the treatise on government is that there are no innate, well, he says in, in, in his essay concerning human understanding, there are no innate principles of the mind. Um, and that indeed how you build up knowledge is by, as it were, a process of negotiation, of trial and error, of experimentation, which is very similar to how you build up a system of government, in his view. And I would like to suggest that it is that mentality that underpins um, the rebuilding of London. Now, um, this is, uh, before we get onto that in more detail, uh, just mention this guy here, uh, Robert Hooke, uh, who is uh, uh, a key figure in that process of rebuilding uh, because he's one of the surveyors, indeed he's almost certainly the most prolific surveyor uh, of the uh, fire-damaged areas um, and establishing ownership and, and uh, condition 
um, through a, a, a very intense survey of the, of the damaged area. But he was already becoming prominent at the time of the fire with his publication of uh, Micrographia, which um, touched on others of his interests, notably um, uh, learning from Bacon in, in the sense that you uh, it develop your knowledge by experiment and inquiry about nature. But his great skill, or among his great skills, um, was building instruments, and he was known for that, and, and conducting experiments, because he becomes the curator of experiments for the Royal Society. And part of this is an interest in optics. So uh, Micrographia, published in 1665, has a number of really remarkable drawings, including this uh, drawing of a fly, um, which is obviously derived from the use of a microscope, the application, as it were, um, of optics. And the, the, the uh, final sort of big key figure we, we need to touch on here because he's again very important in understanding what London was and is and could become uh, is John Evelyn who we see in the portrait on the bottom left. Now uh, in 1660 he writes a remarkable little book uh, called Fumigumium um, and that is um, subtitled the, uh, the inconveniency of the air and smoke of London dissipated together with some remedies for um, humbly proposed by J.E., as in John Evelyn, to his sacred majesty. Now, Evelyn uh, was a royalist. Uh, he came from a royalist family. His uh, family fortune came from his grandfather, who had got the monopoly in manufacturing gunpowder for Elizabeth I. Um, and he spends much of the Cromwellian period in exile on the continent. So he is, see, he is in favor with, uh, with uh, Charles II when he comes back. Uh, and this remarkable little book is really, it's one of the best sources of, of um, um, what London was like in the middle of the 17th century. Um, and again, this is a quote. Um, it, is, it is not without some considerable analogy that sundry of the philosophers have named the air the vehicle of the soul as well as of the earth. And this frail vessel of ours which contains it, i.e. the body, since we are all of us find the benefit which we would derive from it, not only for the necessity of common respiration and functions of the organs, but likewise for the use of spirits and primogene humours, which do most nearly approach that divine particle. So what he's saying is that there, there are two things here, what, and, 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 and both depend on the quality of air. One is just simple, basic, you know, avoidance of disease and avoidance of pain and the, the proper functioning of the body. The other is, as it were, a spiritual or indeed even an intellectual um, uh, interest or, or uh, potential um, that comes from the, uh, the healthy soul, which, as he says, is, is an analogy with air. Now, his remedies for this um, problem of, of, uh, of, of London being inconvenienced by um, smoke and, and bad air are A, to burn aromatic plants, B, to relocate the noxious trades uh, outside the city, and C, to have planting to improve air and health. Now, many of these are still current uh, now. Um, so I think Evelyn uh, uh, deserves a little uh, round of applause, really, for, for his insight, uh, written in 1660. Um, but then, of course, the, uh, the, the Great Fire takes place shortly after that, and it's perhaps some of the problems that Evelyn had uh, alluded to, um, you know, the clustering of buildings close together, um, the uh, sort of random haphazard nature of buildings, um, had some effect on the, on the spread of the fire. And of course, as a great diarist uh, and living in Deptford, he uh, wanders to the South Bank, to Bankside, and he sees the fire burning. And he um, sort of remarks in his diary, plaintively but laconically, London was, but is no more. Now, this slide shows the extent of the fire um, which destroyed 13,200 houses, 87 churches, 52 livery halls, and a whole host of other um, you know, public uh, buildings. So its devastation, as I think we all know, was, was, was pretty total. But within days of it happening, 
Um, people are talking about how to rebuild it. And here are two of the famous plans, both submitted pretty quickly after the fire, which is September 1666. On the top is Wren's plan. Now, Wren is already working uh, in London. He's a professor at uh, Gresham College, um, where uh, he's a colleague of, of Robert Hooke. And Gresham College is, is an interesting body, started... Um, under the, the donation of uh, the great Elizabethan merchant Thomas Gresham, uh, who also founded the Royal Exchange. And it is, it's not a university in the sense we would understand it now, but it is a sort of academic and intellectual uh, institution for London. And um, it is uh, one of the sort of seeds to the Royal Society, and it also is one of the... Um, places of refuge uh, where the city council goes um, after the fire. So, uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the two plans, Wren and Evelyn, are submitted to the king, um, who quite likes them, and indeed they're, they're, he discusses them both with the queen and with his brother, James, Duke of York, subsequently uh, his successor as James II. Um, and again, pretty early on, in February 1667, so that's less than six months after the fire. Parliament passes a rebuilding act. Now, this is significant because a king, had he been uh, his father, had he had the resources of an absolute monarchical position, he would have gone ahead without any need uh, for Parliament to approve this. But Parliament is necessary, not just because it can regulate tax, which, of course, is necessary to rebuild the, at least the public buildings, but also to say what shape this should take. How should private property rights be um, respected or, or, or otherwise uh, is, is, a, is a central part of that. Now, the uh, Building Act of 1667 um, has a number of important stipulations. Uh, buildings should be built in brick or stone, uh, which is an obvious uh, uh, resistance to fire. They should have a maximum number of floors. And also, and this is an important point for the process of rebuilding, um, the guilds, the, the tradesmen's guilds should be reformed and tradesmen should basically be allowed um, to come in and work outside the guild structure, which of course was a complete break with precedent and justified because of the extraordinary circumstances of, of uh, heightened need because of the fire. Now, other points it makes is, is about, um, um, you know, the, the architectural styles. Uh, it obviously wants to see a, um, uh, you know, a, a city that looks grand and modern. Um, uh, the, the thicknesses of walls are specified. The streets, the width of streets are specified. Um, that uh, jetties and, and overhangs are banned um, and that the overall effect of, of buildings resulting from this act was meant to be, quote, harmonious and orderly uh, but without excessive standardisation. Now, the act uh, allowed rebuilding to start pretty quickly but it wasn't seen as adequate because only three years later in 1670 um, a new act was passed and that gives more powers for the widening of streets and also makes provision for the rebuilding of, of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, this is the context in which Barbon emerges. You know, this newly qualified physician who may or may not be trying to practice uh, physic, um, but he begins to see opportunities. And part of these opportunities come from his father's property off Fetter Lane, which is just about the westernmost uh, part of the city which was destroyed. And it destroys really his father's premises and his, his, his uh, means of making a, a, a livelihood. Um, but um, Nicholas sees a way of uh, turning this to advantage because even before the Building Act was passed in 1667, in the latter part of 1666, um, Parliament passes an act which is described as for erecting a judicature for determination of differences touching houses burnt or demolished by reasons of the late fire which happened in London. So basically what, what's that, that saying is it's setting out the legal framework 
in which the rebuilding can take place. Uh, and that is a, incredibly important for Barber because he turns it to opportunities, we shall see. Now, his father's uh, property of Fetter Lane had a 14-year lease on it. Now, as the leaseholder, he was obliged to bear the cost of rebuilding, which, of course, would be substantial. Now, the fire courts are established to adjudicate on such matters. And Nicholas, then, in, in what I think is his first recorded uh, recourse to law, which he subsequently did many times throughout his career, um, it argues, well, if we've got to rebuild this, and in rebuilding it according to these new strictures on what the building should be, um, we are going to create value which will outlive the remains of our lease, our 14-year lease. And uh, so he doesn't look to um, uh, get out of rebuilding, the cost of rebuilding as such. He accepts that as a legal requirement. But he looks for loopholes to strengthen his own position, or the leaseholder's position, of which he becomes because he takes the lease over from his father. And this argument is accepted by the court, who both reduce the ground rent and who then um, uh, extend the lease. So, uh, you know, Barbon, win, you know, by accepting the absolute stricture on it being the leaseholder's obligation to rebuild, he is able to find a lever, a little bit of extra financial wherewithal for himself in that. And on the strength of the reduced ground rent and the um, longer lease, he raises a mortgage of 300 pounds. Now, it seems that some of that probably went to help his father rebuild his business because his father um, doesn't die until 1679 or 1680. So he's still got another 10 years or so to go. Um, but he also then buys another property, and he does more or less the same with that. In other words, he argues in the fire courts that um, the cost of rebuilding falling to him as leaseholder uh, should justify both the reduction in the ground rent paid to the freeholder and a lengthening of the lease. So... Uh, Anyway, so Barbon uh, then is the, um, uh, you know, sees this opportunity which might have existed before in these funny interstices that developers and financiers understand all too well between freehold and leasehold, um, but they are available after the fire on a huge scale. And they are also there is a way of adjusting them and of regulating them through the fire courts, which is set up specifically to uh, encourage rebuilding. So he, he says, yes, we can rebuild, but we have to be able to re-engineer the finances, to use a sort of uh, modern term. Now, at the same time, um, uh, Barbom is thinking about, well, what are these buildings going to be like? Um, and one of his houses is shown here. In fact, that's a house where Samuel Pepys lived for many years. Um, now, it's, uh, it's, it's not a great work of architecture. Um, it, it is clearly uh, owing something to classicism without following a full sort of Albertian system of proportions, orders, and everything else. And in his tract written in 1685, an apology for the builder, um, Barbon sort of is a little bit dismissive of architecture. He says, to write of architecture in its several parts, the situation, platforms, a building, and the quality of materials with their dimensions and ornaments were to transcribe a folio from Vitruvius, and it would therefore be superfluous. Now he continues, the arts belonging to architecture are so well known in a time when every house is a little bit of book of architecture. So it's almost he's arguing that, you know, architecture has already reached a level um, that, uh, which doesn't need to be discussed or debated. It can be just learned from books. And therefore, it is very easy to reproduce. Now, the um, changes in the regulations concerning who could work as craftsmen in the city uh, was a meat and drink to Barbon because it means he's got a, a far bigger pool of labor to call on and therefore can drive prices down.
Um, so, and, and just to say, that's a little surveyor's drawing of the property, uh, typical of the surveyor's work of, of the Barbon property of Fetter Lane. Now, on a much bigger scale, um, this is Barbon by this stage in the 1680s, 1684, Red Lion Square, again, not far from here. Now, Red Lion Square is important for a number of reasons, um, because it, it shows um, the, uh, what, what Barbon had really learned and which he made explicit to the lawyer Roger North, who is probably the best single source for Barbon's character and personality in his autobiography. Uh, and North records that he asked uh, Barbon why he had to work on such a scale. And Barbon replies, it is not worth my while to build little. That a bricklayer could do. So again, we see perhaps a snobbism of the university-educated position against a craftsman coming in there. Um, and uh, North carries on. And this is perhaps most, one of the most important things about Barbon. He, as in Barbon, was the inventor of this new method of building by casting the ground into streets and small houses and to augment their number with as little front as possible and selling the ground to workmen by so much per foot and what he could not sell, he would build himself. This has made ground rents high for the sake of mortgaging and others following his steps have refined and improved upon it and made a superfaction of houses about London. So um, North, who didn't die until the 1730s, lived to see the emergence of Mayfair and the beginnings of some of the other great West End estates. But he credits Barbon, who he knew personally because North had in effect been Barbon's client in the um, uh, rebuilding of the temple where he had chambers um, and uh, you know, was clearly sort of fascinated by him. Um, now, here at Red Lion Square, what uh, Barbon does is exactly as North describes. He divides the land up into narrow strips of houses, which can then be sold on leases with building covenants, so the buyer of the lease has to build to a certain quality within a certain length of time, um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to create the development. Now, this is Red Lion Fields before uh, uh, Bar this is 1682, I think, this pan. Um, and we can see High Haven, we can see a little strip of development along there, but the, the fields basically are agricultural, and this is what happens after Barbon takes hold, and, and, and we see on the right a view of it, and the, the uh, person is uh, Roger North himself. Um, now, the other reason why this is important is because it says quite a lot about how uh, Barbon operated, because um, he... Uh, was subject to legal challenge by lawyers, by, by uh, the um, Gray's Inn uh, uh, sort of benches, um, but it's found that Barbon has acquired the land legally. So there is no real legal comeback against him. But the lawyers then, uh, and Barbon and his workmen, which Barbon leads personally, have a fight. So it resorts to fisticuffs, basically. You know, these presumably, at least in some cases, quite sophisticated lawyers, and there's quite sophisticated developer who, you know, thinks that he is above bricklayers and architects, uh, and probably lawyers as well. Um, he uh, is uh, leading this fight, which he and his gang win, and so the development goes ahead. And it's seen as being successful, because in 1706, so 20-odd so years after it's finished, um, the surveyor Edward Hatton describes it and this is Red Lion Square, a pleasant square of good buildings between High Holborn to the south and Fields to the north. Now, 20 years later, in 1729, the rate book for the area shows that there were 40 houses in the square and six were occupied by knights and two by titled ladies, as, as it, um, um, they were called. So it's, it's quite a sort of upmarket area. One of the knights, a man called Sir Robert Raymond, uh, later became Lord Chief Justice. So not surprisingly, um, it's a place where lawyers live. It's really the heart, as it still is, of, 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 of legal London. Now, um, North is, is, as I say, fascinated by Barbon, and he um, is, talks about Barbon, or writes about Barbon, uh, and the way he related to his creditors, uh, his workers. You know, he, he would, you know, he was a bit like Donald Trump. He didn't like paying his debts. Um, and was quite happy to be sued because what he did was to um, 
uh, uh, use every legal angle he could um, to prevent uh, cases going against him. Um, and uh, he would hold meetings where, in North's phrase, he would dress like a lord of the bedchamber on a birthday. Um, and so he's clearly sort of uh, flaunting his, to some extent, chimeric wealth as a way of impressing people. Now, he's not the first, well, he probably is the first property developer to do that, but he's certainly not the last. Um, and uh, uh, so he's uh, not just working out how to develop London, how to take the need for development and match it to the financial and uh, uh, technical capabilities of the construction industry. Now, we'll just talk about one more of his developments. This is Newport Market, um, sort of Covent Garden, where close to where Charing Cross Road is now, which, of course, didn't come in until the um, uh, 19th century. Now, he bought the old Newport house on this site, um, in either 1681 or 1682 for 9,500 pounds, and he already owned the military ground. Now, he saw that this area was developing, Soho was developing to the west, and of course, his, he and other developments were happening to the east, not very far. His only really serious rival, although uh, working on a much smaller scale, Thomas Neal was building Neal's yard. So it's an area that is going to become um, uh, valuable, he sees. And uh, having bought this property for nine and a half thousand pounds, he manages to raise all sorts of mortgages from different sources, totaling 30,000 pounds. And then some of the people who he takes mortgages from um, raise money on the strength and security of a Barbon signed mortgage. You know, more fool them, as it turns out. Um, now, eventually, he has to sell the, the, the property. He loses a court judgment in 1619. He sells it for 22,600. But in the meantime, he had demolished, a lot of, demolished the old Newport house and uh, let uh, sites to builders and had a total ground rent of £1,000 a year. So if you think that he um, uh, bought it for £9,500, he raises £30,000 in cash, in mortgages, and he gets an income of £1,000 a year. So he's someone who can build these castles in the air uh, at a time when that was still very much in its infancy. Now, he reserves some sites for himself, and on a corner of uh, Porter Street and Great Newport Street, he sold a lease to a saddler called Walter Coates in 1684, um, and the lease is dated May 31st, 1684, and by April of the following year, the lease, lease uh, lessee has to tile and finish the house. Now, that suggests that it was already quite well advanced, but he still has an obligation within a pretty short period um, to finish it, and then obviously he has to pay ground rent for the length of the lease. Now, the lease is typically on this site, this estate, was 61 years, a few a bit less, and one is 71 years, so they're all in the, the same um, order. Now, what Barbon, and this is going back to uh, his comment uh, to North, you know, when asked uh, why he builds on such a scale. Why is there this increase? Now, this is where we have to turn to Barbon, um, the theorist, because he sees the political and economic challenges of rebuilding. He recognizes, having worked in Fetter Lane and Ludgate Hill, places like that, that it's easier to develop the fringe, easier to develop open fields like Red Lion Square than it is in the center. Um, and he also recognizes, is well aware, that in the immediate aftermath of the fire, the suburbs, you know, in uh, uh, Covent Garden, Westminster, um, uh, uh, what's the beginnings of Bloomsbury, I suppose, um, there, the value of those properties increases by 10 times because of people whose houses were burnt in the fire looking for somewhere to live. And many of Barbon's locations are on the fringe of London to the east, uh, to the west, you know, around the Strand, around Hoban, where he is, 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 plays a big part in infilling the land, much of it of uh, uh, aristocratically owned houses, or much of it also former monastic land between um, uh, Westminster and the City of London itself. Now, Barbon argues, and this is a quote, new buildings are advantageous to the king and the government, they are instrumental in, in to the preserving and increasing the number of subjects 
and numbers of subjects is the strength of a prince, for houses are hives for the people to breed and swarm in, without which they cannot increase. And unless they are provided for them from time to time, uh, in proportion to their increase, they will be forced to go into plantations and other countries for habitations, and so many times become subjects of other princes. So what he's saying there is that unless we build, people will go off. And um, the restrictions on building uh, imposed by law are therefore counterproductive because they undermine the potential of people <coughs> to generate wealth. And, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he shows how, um, you know, with not very sophisticated um, statistical analysis, um, that the population of London has increased by looking at the number of burials. And in this, he follows uh, William Petty, the early statistician who we mentioned earlier. Now, um, Barbon goes on because he says, you know, that it's, it's all very fine. We can show the need, therefore, for the increase in population. We can show the benefits to the state of the increase in population. But what about to the individual? <clears throat> and he says, you know, uh, uh, humans have, um, you know, two basic wants. So the wants of the body, which are relatively easy to meet, <clears throat> and then uh, there are the wants of the mind, which Barbon says, the wants of the mind are infinite. In other words, what you imagine you might want, what you desire, rather than what you actually need to keep clothed, warm, fed, etc., <coughs> is uh, infinite. Now, this is a very, very modern sentiment, and it's a modern sentiment that would be recognized by 20th century economists like J.K. Galbraith um, and the affluent society. <coughs> but Bourbon goes on. Man naturally aspires, and as his mind is elevated, his senses grow more refined and more capable of delight. His desires are enlarged, and his wants increase with his wishes which is for everything that is rare, can gratify his senses, adorn his body, and promote the ease, pleasure, and pomp of <laughs> mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, amongst a great variety of things to satisfy the wants of the mind are those that adorn man's body and advance the pomp of life and have the most general use and in all ages amongst all sorts of mankind have been of value. So basically what he's saying, it's the frivolous that makes money. Now, that is, I think, a very modern um, economic sentiment. Now, um, he's also very keen to promote the idea of this added value through the, the wants of the mind as opposed to the needs of the body. And he argues that uh, you know, he has a famous row with John Locke, <coughs> who John Locke had argued that coins should be worth their weight in whatever metal they were made out of, and Barbon says, well, that's nonsense. You know, he says, <coughs> all the arguments in Mr. Locke's book against the raising of, of value of money are drawn from the single supposition that there is an intrinsic value in silver. Well, you know, Locke might have thought there was an intrinsic value in silver because it was with a silver um, sort of uh, device that he had saved Lord Shaftesbury's life. Um, but actually, he was articulating a common view which is that the basis of a stable society was a stable coinage, the fixed rate of interest. And this is what Barbon is arguing against. In other words, he's arguing for a free market approach rather than a mercantilist, thank you, or a uh, regular, um, uh, you know, a regulated approach. Um, so that, and I think in that sense, he comes across as, as, uh, as a very modern figure. Uh, in his arguments for the increase in London. And as I say, here we have um, his second uh, economic tra discourse of trade published in 1690 uh, and uh, a, a modern cover of uh, the Apology for the Builder published in 1685. Um, and then uh, here is uh, William Petty, who he cites with some approbation. Now, Petty is an interesting character. He is... Um, Born in 1623, goes to sea, is put ashore as a cabin boy or former cabin boy because he breaks his leg um, in uh, France, where he writes uh, a letter of application to the local Jesuit college. Not he's a Roman Catholic, he wants an education. 
And um, he's accepted, rather surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, because he wrote the letter in Latin. So he's already showing intellectual ability, in other words. Now, the, the, um, Petty then has a sort of strange career. He works, um, he goes to Amsterdam, he meets Descartes, this is in the 1630s and 40s. He then goes to Paris, where he becomes a secretary to Thomas Hobbes, who we mentioned earlier. He then goes back to England and goes to Oxford, where he works with Robert Boyle, the scientist, basically helping with experiments, and he's on the fringes then of the group around Bodham College. Um, and he helps to save the life of this unfortunate hanging victim. Um, but then he uh, is involved in the survey of Ireland after the Cromwellian invasion of Ireland, and he uses that, and not only, I mean, he, he undercuts all the other bidders, but he uses that to acquire great wealth and lands for himself, which his descendants, uh, the Marquises of Lansdowne, um, still, uh, in, men, in much of it, still own. So he's um, a progenitor of one of the great aristocratic families uh, of, of, of uh, England. Now, um, Barbon argues uh, for, for this uh, increase in building in essentially simple argument, but it's, it's couched in terms that appeal to the late 17th century mind. Um, and also addressing the issues of, of the time. The cause of the increase in building, uh, he, he says, is from the divinely ordained, my, my insertion, natural increase of mankind. But now he, in this sense, prefigures Malthus 100 or so years later. Now, Malthus saw the population growth as an invitation to disaster, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but Barbon saw it as a blessing because he says food, clothes, and a house are necessary for everyone, so more people means more building, as well as more work for bricklayers, carpenters, plasterers, and many more traders. In other words, it's a sort of boosterish argument. The more growth, um, the, you know, the more wealth. Uh, the more building, um, the more wealth will be created, and, and the greater will be the power of the state. Now, <coughs> activities like husbandry and by implication, like architectural building, allow the advantages of population growth to accrue um, to the people and their rulers. Now, again, this is a quote. Without arts, which is Barbon's word for human artifice as opposed to sort of painting, sculpture, whatever, a great number of people cannot live together. So the way you make a city depends on, you know, rational thought. And neither can there be any great cities. Moreover, larger cities, he says, raise the rent of the old houses. So not only do uh, uh, growing cities allow more people to live together, but they also increase value, they create value. And this increase in value ripples outwards from the center as they expand. And the rippling effect reaches the country, countryside around the city uh, because it supplies the city with stones, bricks, lime, iron, lead, timber, etc., and it also provides living and working opportunities for the younger sons of gentry. And he may there be thinking of his friend Roger North, who was the younger son of a peer, and the children of yeoman and peasants. And um, in a nod to the landowning party, he argues that growing cities increase rather than decrease the value of rural land precisely because it is the rural land that supplies these wants of the urban populations. Now, this is arguing against a, a, a view that was being put forward at the time, that you have to restrict growth, you have to stop things happening, because otherwise the values will drop. Well, Barbon is saying precisely the opposite, that the values will increase if you allow more growth. Now, obviously, that's, uh, he has an interest in saying that. Um, and he, con he concludes in uh, the Apology for the Builder by outlining the imminent advantages of London's growth. And this is a quote. The city of London has made such a progress within this last five and 20 years, that's uh, since 1660, as to have grown one third bigger and become already the metropolis of Europe, not with understanding the popular error the nation have been infected with. And the ill censures and discouragement of the builders have met with uh, had they been for this last hundred years encouraged by the government, the city of London might probably have easily grown three times bigger than it now is. So, you know, the, the uh, restrictions have been an encumbrance and have been counterproductive. 
And he goes on. And if we consider what the natural effects of so great a city must have been to be furnished with such large provisions for war suitable to its greatness, such a vast number of ships, ships being situated on an island and navigable river, it would long before this time have been a terror to all Europe. Remember, this is the time when the French, sorry, the Dutch are regularly threatening London, uh, and to be made the metropolis of the world. So he's anticipating a future for London that many people would argue it did acquire, but perhaps not for another 150 or 200 years. Um, so he, 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 he says, and this is from his subsequent track, the, the um, uh, of trade, um, it is not necessity that causes the consumption. Nature may be satisfied with little, but it is the wants of the mind fashion and desire of novelties and things scarce that causeth trade. Um, a person may have English lace, gloves or silk as much as he wants and will buy no more such, yet lay out his money on a, a point of Venice of jessamine gloves or French silks. He may desire to eat Vestphalia bacon when he will not eat English, so that the prohibition of foreign wares does not necessarily cause a greater consumption of the like sort of English. Beside, there is the same want of the mind in foreigners as in the English. They desire novelties. They value English cloth, hats and gloves, and foreign goods more than their natives make. In other words, what he's saying is increased choice. It, the competition will be cancelled out. On the other hand, if you restrict choice, um, you uh, uh, deny the potential to add value through satisfying the wants of the mind. The chief causes that promote trade, not to mention good governments, peace and situation with other advantages, are industry on the poor and liberality in the rich. Liberality is the free usage of all those things that are made by the industry of the poor for the use of the body and mind. It relates chiefly to man's self, but does not hinder him from being liberal to others. Now, there are all sorts of subsequent echoes in economic theory here, not, not least in Adam Smith, um, and we can hear I think um, some uh, current people in uh, being prefigured in Barbon's sentiments. Um, but perhaps the single most significant subsequent economist to cite him is a certain Karl Marx, um, who, when he's introducing his theory of commodi commodification at the beginning of Das Kapital, and that essentially uh, rests on the distinction between use and exchange value, which we've already sort of seen in, in Barbon's arguments, um, and, and this is a quote, the exchange relation of commodities is characterized precisely by its ab abstraction from their use values. As old Barbon says, one sort of wares are as good as another if the value be equal. There is no difference or distinction in things of equal value. So for Barbon, there is a concept of value which is not embodied in the weight of a coin or the amount of silver or gold that a coin contains, uh, the value is determined by exchange, by trade. And it is that that he sees as the great sort of advantage of building because um, more building is not only a trade in and of itself, it employs traders, but it creates more and more wants. As he says in one of the quotes I read out earlier, um, you know, as, as uh, men develop, they become more sophisticated and therefore the wants of their mind increase, which is, uh, in his view at least, the motor of wealth generation. So, uh, beginning to come to the end, uh, what is his legacy? Well, I would argue his legacy um, is in the system uh, by which London was developed and some of the greatest fortunes uh, in the country were made. So I show here um, Mayfair on the right, uh, uh, Belgravia uh, on the left, and Regent's Park and, and, and uh, Marlebone, all of which were developed as uh, privately held estates, to some extent they still are, um, on principles uh, that Barbon had first in, it used and that were des described uh, by Roger North. And of course, it is that system of development not only has created great wealth for a few um, very ultra-rich families, uh, but it has also, uh, I think, made London a livable city. It's kept the 
heights relatively low, it's laid out public space, it's guaranteed a certain quality of building and a certain quality of maintenance. And here, the ghost of John Locke is also there because what happens when uh, the, the, these great estates start to develop, of which obviously the Grosvenor is, is the most uh, single most significant, um, is that in effect, uh, the landowners defer the profits, the value of their estate, to their, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren through the long lease, the 99-year lease. Now, they were able uh, to do that, at least, because of the political principles outlined by John Locke, which then feed into um, the English political establishment through the sort of notion of, of Whiggism, uh, and so someone like uh, Thomas Grosner, who, who was the uh, head of the family at the time, who was a contemporary of Barbon, um, they were both members of parliament, and indeed they both act as tellers on a vote on, uh, believe it or not, uh, a reform of freehold act, um, which, uh, in which they both obviously had an interest. And, uh, but without the guarantee that the same sort of regime would be in existence 100 years into the future, it, I would argue it's unlikely that those families would have deferred the profits to subsequent generations. So this becomes both a beneficiary of, as it were, the Lockean political view, respecting property rights, hierarchy of uh, social structures, but also a sense of toleration um, that the uh, uh, that London was able to develop, not just to rebuild from the fire, but to expand massively uh, in the 50 to 100 years after that. Now, that's part of his legacy, and I think another of his legacies is fire insurance. We haven't had time to go into that, but fire insurance was one of Barbon's innovations, and uh, by 1680, 1681, he's insuring 5,000 homes. So we could say, or his company is insuring 5,000 homes, we could say that what Barbon is doing is not just creating the motor for creating wealth, he is also devising a means to protect that wealth through insurance. Um, and what is Wren's legacy? Well, I think Wren's legacy is, is, is of a very different order. I think it's more about the image of London. Um, so I'm showing here two images, whereas with Barbon I was showing plans. And of course, there's a famous canaletto from the terrace of Richmond House um, looking downriver, uh, and we see St. Paul's there. Uh, and then, of course, the famous uh, image taken just across the road from here of uh, St. Paul surviving the Blitz, thanks to fire watchers like the architectural historian John Summerson. And indeed, my, my grandfather was also a fire watcher on the day of St. Paul's at the time. Um, Wren created one of the few buildings whose silhouette immediately stands for a city. And therefore, I think, you know, uh, he created an image, he created an icon um, that represents a city. But I think his, his, his legacy is, uh, is richer than that. Um, because I think uh, it depends perhaps on three particular attributes. One is clearly his political connections, which as we, uh, outlined at the beginning, come to some extent from his family background. Uh, another is a proven administrative skill that he can get on with people, he can run quite a big office, a surveyor of, of, of works, get very big buildings built, orchestrate a team of prima donnas, which include of course Nicholas Hawksmore, um, to work with him and for him, uh, and to set some sort of pattern by which they can all contribute to moving more or less, if not entirely, in the, in the same direction. But I think there is another really important aspect to Ren's legacy which is an ability to incorporate new ideas coming from the new science and new learning into architecture. So he can, obviously, he is, in loose generic terms, a classical architect. He draws on the traditions of classical architecture. For example, in his uh, first building, the Sheldonian Theatre uh, in Oxford, he adapts the model of the Roman amphitheatre and puts a roof on it. Now, the important thing there is that he adopts a classical model which didn't have a roof, and then he puts a roof on it using his mathematical skill because he's able to calculate how you can make a truss that can carry the roof 
without intermediate columns. And that, so I think there we see him infusing architecture um, with new ideas. And I think this is why, um, you know, architects uh, t can often be a bit sniffy about him. You know, even towards the end of his very long life, he knew that his architecture was being criticized by you know, Colleen Campbell and um, um, uh, Burlington, the, the creators of English Palladianism, which obviously held sway in British architecture for, for much of the 18th century. Um, but also, more recently, in the 1930s, John Summerson wrote a fascinating essay on the mind of Wren, which is terribly sort of uh, sniffy in a sort of prize essay type, type way about him. Um, but I think this becomes explicit in another architecture historian of, of more recent time, Rainer Bannum, who died in 1988. And uh, in his final published work, um, which is uh, the black box, a secret profession of architecture. Um, Bannum writes, um, the difference between Wren and Hawksmoor, I have finally decided, this grand old man at the end of his life, is that Hawksmoor was an architect and Wren not. Even when Wren was being as clever as he was in widening the central bay in each arcade at St. Mary Le Beau, or as inventive as he was in the upper parts of St. Stephen Warbrook, which we see on the screen now, um, he was still not doing what it was that Hawksmoor had done to make great architecture out of as humdrum a concept as the interior of St. Mary Walnoff. So, yes, you know, it gets credit for being clever, but in the English system, that obviously um, is a slightly arch and barbed uh, term to use. Um, Bannum goes on to suggest that they're practicing, this is Hawksmoor and Wren, fundamentally different modes of designing. The persistence of drawing, Bannon writes, disegno, using the Italian Renaissance term, at a kind of meta pattern that subsumes all other patterns and shelters them from scrutiny. That's what Hawksmoor's doing, and Wren, by implication, can't. For architects being an, unable to think without drawing became the true mark of one fully socialized into the profession of architecture, which he argues Wren was not and Hawksmoor was. Now, I would argue that such narrow thinking is a complete anathema to Wren and his colleagues around the Royal Society, and indeed many of his contemporaries, who are precisely looking for ways of broadening out what architecture was, or indeed any discipline, whether it was medicine, mathematics, uh, think of Wilkins uh, mathematical magic, he's trying to popularize an otherwise esoteric uh, uh, subject, um, as in some ways Wren was trying to do with architecture, and uh, many of them were trying to make medicine uh, more and more useful. Um, and so Wren and his colleagues, they, they, they want to uh, question experiment with and test ideas and it was the point of the Royal Society and of that generation uh, to do just that. Now I would argue that, that uh, it's not St Paul's that is Wren's greatest building uh, but this church St Stephen Warbrook which was built uh, was designed around 1670 so when Wren was working on the great plan version of St Paul's which was his favorite plan but, but, but wasn't um, built um, and in it, I would argue that he achieves a synthesis um, that a dogged church building for at least 200 years by this time between the centralized and longitudinal plan by this very subtle, clever placement of columns and just taking out a few of them to allow a dome to sit there. So the dome represents a centralized plan where the columns describe a longitudinal plan with a nave um, uh, and uh, two transepts and a, and, a, and a Latin cross. And you can see here some of his other churches which experiment with uh, geometry in similar ways. I mean, even Bannum recognizes the cleverness of, of, of some of them. But what I argue is that this goes beyond mere cleverness, mere showmanship of intellectual ability, because what he's doing is achieving a synthesis, as I say, between the centralized and longitudinal plan, but also between the Episcopalian worship promoted by his father and uncle and the Presbyterian worship, which had uh, dominated the uh, Crom Cromwellian period and, and uh, Cromwell and his supporters. And he does that not just by his ability to manipulate geometry, and to go beyond 
the sort of Albertian proportional systems and therefore to challenge, as it were, the classical canon that his successors Burlington and, and Campbell wanted to reimpose through looking back at uh, Inigo Jones of a generation before then, um, but also through the use of light, through his interest in optics, um, and light as the sort of um, challenge to superstition and the challenge to um, uh, 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 dogma and um, uh, conventional thought. So I, I think what, what Ren is doing here is, is embodying uh, a toleration. Now, toleration is something which is often, as I've alluded to, attributed to John Locke as a philosopher. Uh, he set a basis, or is believed at least, to set a basis through which society could emerge from the religious and political horrors that had taken place really from the Reformation onwards for the next 150 years. Um, but Locke's centrality in this achievement has recently been challenged by the American scholar based at Oxford, Theresa Bijan, who argues that, that um, uh, toleration would remain a dangerously self-defeating proposition until the day men surrendered their unreasonable enthusiasms in religion and gave up the rampant incivility and verbal prosecutions they inspired. And that is what she attributes Locke's view of toleration to be, or, or, or argues it to be. In other words, it's self-defeating because it is, it is impaled by its own belief in reason. Because how can you be tolerant of something you think is unreasonable? If, if you think reason is a be-all and end-all. So what I'm arguing here, and, and not arguing because I think it would um, take more research than I've been able to do, but suggesting is that Wren is not just infusing his architecture with new thought and new learning and geometry and optics, but also in doing so is achieving a toleration, a sense of toleration, an embodiment of toleration indeed, that eluded even as subtle and sophisticated a thinker of, um, of, uh, as John Locke. And so I would argue that St. Stephen Warbrook is an even more powerful symbol than St. Paul's itself. And I would argue in, in absolute final word now that it is this ambiguous interaction of wealth and toleration that is a shared legacy of Barbon and Wren and has given us much of the city that we have now. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, thank you very much for that. Well, <clears throat> a tour d'horizon of um, a political, scientific, and economic thought across the 17th century. Take a seat, we're not going to do questions. Um, and then, of course, this remarkable figure, um, Nicholas Barbon. And I think the fact that Karl Marx um, quotes him uh, at the start of Capital, and yet I, I suspect most Londoners never heard of Nicholas Barbon, don't know what he did. And, and haven't any idea of significance. And I think that this placing him in that context uh, of that extraordinary circle uh, around Wadham College uh, and the, the sort of scientific discovery and promotion uh, which becomes the basis for the Enlightenment um, is, is something we need to remember uh, now because the references that Jeremy made to people like Evelyn and their, their interest in clean air, this is sounding awfully uh, relevant to what we're experiencing today. Uh, the Barbon proposition about endless growth creating value is of course especially relevant in a London where we have not built enough uh, for 30 or 40 years. So we've seen the increase in value from a result of population increase, but we haven't seen the increase uh, in the building of necessary homes. So I think there are all sorts of kind of tendrils in what we've heard this evening, stretching through uh, to uh, the present day. And I suppose it's proof positive that if you want to understand the present and you want to have any chance at all of creating an improved future, you better mind 
your history. Can I conclude by thanking once again uh, Gerald Bowie for uh, organising this event, uh, to the Wren Insurance Association uh, for allowing us to, uh, to film uh, and uh, broadcast to, uh, I hope, uh, many people who've enjoyed the lecture as much as I did. Thank you, for all, thank you to you all for your attendance uh, and we hope for slightly healthier circumstances uh, when we run next year's talk. Uh, tonight is the eve of Wren's birthday, uh, so at one minute past midnight, if you can find a pub or a restaurant that's still open, you could drink a toast to him, or better still, do it from the comfort of your own home. It's a safe journey home, and thank you very much indeed. <laughs>